for being with us tonight. If you'd all find your place and stand up, grab your home books. We're going to turn to 629. 629. Mansion over the hilltop.
595. 595 in one day. Thank you for this week, Lord. Thank you for church. Thank you for your word, Lord. Thank you that we can hold it in our hands. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and him paying our sin debt on the cross of Calvary, Lord. Thank you that you are coming back, Lord. Thank you for that. Please, Lord, use Brother Summerdorf tonight to speak to our hearts, Lord. I pray for the, the one in here that may be lost, Lord. I pray that you would convict their heart, speak to them personally, Lord. Um, Father, for, the, for those of us who are saved, thank you for this meeting, Lord. Thank you for what's been preached. Thank you for speaking to our hearts already, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Amen. Amen. Well, what great, wonderful, appropriate songs for this week. One day he's coming. 
Boy, if you haven't been with us this week, I encourage you to go back and watch the messages online because it has been, uh, Bob, say this, Jesus Christ has been lifted up, and it has just been a wonderful, wonderful time, and we thank the Summerdorfs uh, for spending this time with us, and we look forward to hearing from him uh, once again tonight. Uh, but I do want to welcome anyone who might be with us here for the very first time. If you've never been with us before, or maybe you've been coming a while and haven't stopped by the visitor's booth, if you wouldn't mind doing that after the service right there in the middle of the foyer, they would love to give you a visitor's packet and answer any questions you might have. Again, thank you very much. Just really a couple of quick announcements here, and we'll sing another song. Uh, just a reminder to the gals once again that the ladies' Bible study and the hospitality sign-ups are still going on right out in the foyer on the table there. And then looking forward to this weekend, we do have bus visitation at 10 a.m. Looking for some, our last, last few gorgeous days, I guess you could say. So I know this Saturday will be beautiful. 10 a.m., if you've got any questions about bus visitation, you can contact Brother Ethan Sweet, and his phone number is in the bulletin. And then we have men's prayer meeting at 7 p.m., and uh, th last week we had a great time at 6, having some food, and we had then uh, the uh, service obviously afterwards, but this will be just back to our regular time and regular routine, 7 p.m. for the men over in the chapel. And again, thank you very much. It has been such a wonderful week. I hope you got a blessing, and we look forward to the rest of it tonight. And at this time, I'm going to ask Brother Rasmussen to lead us in another song. All right, stand up one more time. Let's turn to 602. 602, when we all get to heaven. 600.
first. Here we go. While we walk the pilgrim path, we come to lose and lost us. But when traveling days are over, not a shadow on our side. When we all get to heaven, what a day of rejoicing that will be. When we all see Jesus. What a blessing to see a good crowd tonight if you are a visitor or if you're tuning in online as a visitor. You're a very special guest. We appreciate you being here. And uh, one regret that I have is um, your pastor and his wife took Deb and I out to eat and I ate too much. <laughs> and those in the front three rows are in trouble. I feel like I'm at grandma's house for Thanksgiving, you know, they just feed you too much. So this is the one night I wish the song, lead, song service was an hour long, but I'm up. So I want to do something first, though. I want to read a thank you note. Uh, this thank you is from the Summerdorfs, and uh, we usually go ahead and mail these things, but due to strict budget cuts, <laughs> cost of fuel, all of that, we just read the little sucker now, all right? So... Dear Dr. DeMichael and church family, a quick note to thank you for the opportunity to be a part of your fall revival services. I'm assuming I just put that label on there. Don't know if that's what you called it. And to worship and fellowship together in the Lord and to see what the Lord continues to accomplish in your midst. Many thanks for your kind care of us throughout our stay, from the wonderful RV hookups and use of the vehicle. And by the way, staff, I love that vehicle with a rack on it, all right? You'll, you'll be reading about some of the things I did today in the paper tomorrow, but I just want you to know I love that. Don't give me another vehicle next time through. That, that is, it's amazing how fast you can get to some places when you're a little behind schedule with that thing. <laughs> I keep talking, I'll get no vehicle next time I'm here. Thank you for the RV hookups, use of the vehicle, the gift basket and spending money, as well as the wonderful meals that you treated us to and the fellowship that accompanied them, such a delight. Also, thank you in advance for the love gift bestowed upon us. We know that it will be more than we deserve. We can only hope that somehow we have been as great a blessing to you as you have been to us. Already looking forward to our next time together. Until then, may you continue faithful to your King, for He is coming again soon. Our love and gratitude, Brother Dave and Miss Deb, our ministry verse, 2 Corinthians 4, 5. P.S. Special thanks for helping with our travel expenses as well. And also, don't forget to rise and shine and give God the glory. Amen? So, Pastor, I'm going to go ahead and just hand deliver that to you. All right? And then we have a special gift for Sister Carol. If, if you could just wind your way this way. I know this probably isn't the favorite restaurant, but I know uh, you enjoy it, and so we have a $50 gift card for you from 
uh, Louis Italian where we were tonight. That's why we took a little longer to get out of there. And uh, it comes, though, with a real string attached, right? Well, I shouldn't say this. I was going to say you can't take kids or grandkids, but in lieu of your husband, that might be the better way to go. I don't know, but <laughs> I'm saying if you take an adult, they have to be well-behaved, all right? Oh, okay. So we, we appreciate <laughs> you. Yeah, amen. <laughs> amen. Take your Bibles tonight. Let's go to Revelation 19. Boy, did you hear the news break today. All the networks missed it, but the Word of God still declares it, a king is coming. And he's just not any old king, he's the king of kings and lord of lords, and if you're saved tonight, he's your king. And he's my king as well, and he's coming again for you and me. Revelation 19, I want to begin reading in verse number 1. Revelation 19 and verse number 1, the Bible says, And after these things, what things would that be? All the plagues, the vile judgments that leveled planet earth, as the king took what rightfully belonged to him, and that would be glory from those who refused to give it to him and gave it to someone else. And after these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, What an interesting word here. Say it with me out loud. Alleluia. What does that word mean? By the way, in your Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, this is the only place in the Word of God this word even occurs. And it occurs four times in six short verses. The word Alleluia means praise the Lord, bold, all caps, underline, biggest font you can get with exclamation points all over the place. That's what hallelujah means. He says, hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgments. For he hath judged the great horror which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, hallelujah. And her smoke rose up forever and ever. The four and twenty elders and the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne saying, Amen. Hallelujah. And look at verse 11. He says, And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, and out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings, and Lord of Lords. We've seen the portrait of our King. We've considered the perception of our King. The last two nights we looked at the power and the possession of our King, but tonight as the book of Revelation closes out, I want to consider the promise and the pleasure of our King. I want to consider with the Lord's help tonight the promise and the pleasure of our King. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you tonight for the honor to be in your house and with your people, and thank you that we can call you our Father. And we come to you in the wonderful name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and we ask in his name your blessing upon our time. For the one who may not even be saved, tuning in, maybe here among us, we pray tonight you would show them who they really are, reveal to them who you truly are, and then, Father, may their soul find refuge in the finished work of Calvary, the person of your Son. May they be saved tonight. And then for each of us that are saved, help us, Lord, as your return is so near. Help us, Lord, by your grace to faithfully run our race. Help us to be able to say when we hear the cry, Behold, he cometh, that our hearts with great sincerity say, Amen, even so come, Lord Jesus. Please bless the thought now, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. 
Amen. The promise and pleasure of our King. Earlier, the Lord comes for his saints, but here in Revelation 19, we see him coming with his saints, and may I add this, as he promised. Look at the promise that he gave almost 2,000 years ago. Back, go back to John chapter 14, and notice the promise that Jesus Christ made in John chapter 14, just prior to his departure to heaven. Notice here in John 14, he's talking to his disciples. He's getting close to Calvary. and He makes a promise here in John 14 in verse number 1. He says, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, he says, believe also in me. I just need to pause here and remind you that just believing in God isn't enough. Amen. You must believe in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. He says in verse 2, In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, look at these four words. He makes this incredible promise over 19 centuries ago. He said, I will come again. Wow. Wow. Long before General MacArthur made the promise, I shall return. And as a mortal, he fulfilled and kept his word. Long before that was even stated, Jesus Christ said, I will come again. That's quite a promise, isn't it? Those four words. There's mockers today that would say there's no way that this Jesus is coming again. Second Peter 3 tells us, but the day of the Lord will come. But you know those words, I will come again, there were four words probably even greater prior to his return, and it was this, I will rise again. And he did. And as sure as he rose again, just as certainly he will come again as he promised. Amen? I love how Thomas says to him, Lord, we don't know the way. Lord, the GPS system isn't working. How do we get to this place called heaven? And Jesus said, you don't need to worry about the how, you just need to focus on the who. Jesus said to them, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh to the Father but by me. Amen? You got the Son, you got life. You have the Son, you don't need to worry about getting yourself to heaven. He'll do it for you. Amen? You have the Son, you don't need to worry about a resurrection. He takes care of all of that. It's not all the what's, it's the who. His name is Jesus Christ. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And no one gets to God but by Him. But He makes a promise that will come again, and the day of the Lord will come. Go back to Revelation 19, and notice here, on the verge of Jesus Christ's return, physically to earth, heaven begins to quiver with anticipation. Alleluia's begin to break out as time's almost over now, and eternity's about ready to be ushered in. Heaven just begins to quiver with anticipation. Just like the final seconds of a game. Amen? It's interesting to me, I, I'm a bit of a sports guy, but you follow football, and I know the Broncos are here, and I don't think they're in the top 25 this year, or are they? No. But it's interesting when you have a game that time is involved in. Could be basketball, could be football. It's interesting, as those final seconds start chipping down, the response of those that are watching the game. You see, because there's always one side, I call it the losing side, that does not want to see this game come to an end. And you can tell who they are. They're trying to get out of the stadium early. They're not smiling at all. Their heads are down. They're looking horrible. They just don't want to see this thing end because they know they're going to lose. But then there's another side of that stadium, the winning side. And they can't wait for those last seconds to chip off. I mean, they're already celebrating. 
I mean, they're straining against security. I mean, they're wanting to run out on the field. You know what I'm saying? And I want to just say this. You can tell a lot about whose side you're on by how you're acting when time runs out. If time runs out for you right now, and you get the notice you just have a couple days to live, how does that hit you? If you're not saved, this is the only life you got. And you're not going to be happy when time runs out. Amen? When those last sands of, of time go through your hourglass of life, you're, you're not going to be happy. You have no idea where you're going. But for the believer, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And here in Revelation 19, I'm telling you, the winning side is starting to get revved up. Hallelujah, hallelujah. They know this thing is coming to a close shortly. They know time. They know this is in the bag, and this is going to be notched up as the biggest eternal win they have ever experienced. They cannot wait for eternity to get ushered in and time to end forevermore. And in Revelation 19, verse 11, with a roar, we see the line of the tribe of Judah return to establish his kingdom, to judge Satan once and for all, and to usher in eternity. And just like any game, we see winners and we see losers. First of all, we see those who lose it all in this game called life. Notice they're noted here in Revelation chapter 20, beginning in verse 10. Here's, here's the roster of those who lose it all. This is the losing side. And notice who the coach and the head of this whole team is in verse 10 of Revelation 20. And the devil. i just make it real clear tonight. The devil's not a winner. He's a loser. I was doing a teen rally. He's a loser. All right? Notice who joins him. It says, The devil that deceived him was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone, where the beast and the false prophet are, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Verse 11, this is a glimpse ahead of the losers. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And and the dead were judged out of those books, those things which were written in the books according to their works. Verse 13, the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Here we see those who lose it all. I call them the court of the condemned, and there's no peace. There's no rest. There's no joy. And let me add this, there is no remembrance that they ever existed. You know, I was always fascinated when I traveled America with a Corvette. Of all the things I had on that thing, one of the things many of the veterans would point to was my MIA POW sticker on the back window. I would get to hear stories about guys they left behind, not really sure if they were still alive. Vietnam, Korea. You know, it's interesting that when you look at war, one of the greatest horrors that any soldier, sailor, airman, marine will ever experience is being all by himself being left behind, presumed dead, and forgotten. But even in the midst of that, there was always this hope someone was looking for them. Someone knew they hadn't come home. Someone knew they were out there somewhere, maybe alive, and there were people still trying to find them. But you understand, if you die without Jesus Christ, and you go to that place called the Lake of Fire, heaven and all of us that are there cannot enjoy heaven knowing you're there. God will have to wipe the memory that you ever existed out of our minds. You all with me? You know, people say there's only two deaths. There's actually three. 
There's a physical death, a spiritual death, but then the Jews would always say this, he is not dead who is remembered. How many times we've sat around at a get-together, grandpa's gone, and we begin to talk about grandpa. You remember when grandpa did this? And remember when he fell out of that chair? And all of a sudden, for a moment, in everybody's minds, there's grandpa. You remember him. He's alive in your mind. You can hear his voice. You laugh about who he was. But in heaven, there'll be no memory of those who are lost. The pain itself would destroy heaven. In fact, in Revelation 21.4, it says, For the redeemed, the former things won't even come to our mind. That is being dead in every sense of the word, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. No one even knows or cares you're in the lake of fire. Why did I say that? Well, first of all, it's true. You put these puzzle pieces together, it's very true. But second of all, here's the thing. I told Deb, I always struggle trying to get people to see the great loss of rejecting Jesus Christ. I really can't do it. The Holy Spirit of God has to do this. But I can say this. The consequences are so huge. If you miss heaven... You have to get this right. You have to get this right. You all with me? You can't approach eternity going, well, you know, I think I'm okay. you got to nail this down. If you have doubts, you need to nail it down. Because you see, this is the final season. There's not another season to get it right if you mess it up. There's no redos. There's no second place prize. You either get it all or you lose it all 100% based on what you do with Jesus Christ. The consequences are so huge. You've got to get this thing nailed down. Amen? So we see those who lose it all in the game of life, forgotten forever. But then we see, look at how opposite this is. We see, second of all, those who gain it all. Look in Revelation 21. I call this the roster of the redeemed. Revelation 21. And notice what's said in verse number 24. Who are they who gain it all when time expires? Who are, who are the winners for all eternity? Well, the Bible tells us in verse 24 of Revelation 21, and the nations of them which are what? saved it's the saved shall walk in the light of it speaking of the new jerusalem and look at verse 27 and there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth neither whatsoever worketh abomination or maketh a lie and who are these saved they which are written in the lamb's book of life wow (laughs) who are those who gain it all Well, they're the ones who are saved and in the Lamb's book of life. And look at what they receive in verse 4 of Revelation 21. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And it's the polar opposite of the lake of fire. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow, nor crying. Neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. Wow. Complete opposite. This is the record that God hath given to us eternal life. And this life is in his Son. He that hath the Son hath life. He that hath not the Son of God hath not life. And these things ever written to you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life. Amen? Are you there tonight? As time is running out, the final, we are approaching the soon return of Jesus Christ. Which side are you on? Are you on the side that, that's the losing side, or are you on the side that's the winning side? There'll be no more pain, no more death, no more sorrow, nor crying. Man, there's a song that comes to, to my mind every time I read verse 4. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come, no more clouds in the sky, no more tears to dim the eye. All is peace forevermore. 
on that happy golden shore. What a day, glorious day, that will be. Oh, what a day that will be, when my Jesus I shall see, when I look upon his face, the one who saved me by his grace, when he takes me by the hand and leads me to that promised land, what a day, glorious day that will be. Can you sing that with your heart tonight? Are you on the winning side? Well, then for you, the best is yet to come. And the only hell you'll ever taste will be this life before you're ushered into this incredible new life in the presence of Jesus Christ. We see those who lose it all. We see those who gain it all. And if you want to flip your notes, I notice here the pleasure of our King is manifested for those of us that are saved. First of all, in forgiving us of all our sins. Write that in. Just There's two things that the King is pleased to give everyone that is in his kingdom, that is in his family. Number one, it's his pleasure in forgiving us of all our sins. Look in Revelation 21, verse 1. Something here that's kind of fascinating. In Revelation 21, and verse 1, it says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. I I don't know how you take that, but when I looked at that for the first time, I said it just seems so out of place. I get the new heaven, I get the new earth, but there was no more sea. I said, what in the world is that? There, There was no more sea. I mean, this was a big point, obviously. The Lord put it in there. I begin to just think on it and just ruminate it. I want you to pause for a moment. I want you to think about something you've said in the past, done or thought that you would never want somebody else to know you did or thought or said that. Can you think of something, at least one thing? In fact, it would make you blush if it got put on the screen right now. Y'all with me? You with me? It's shameful. It's... It's just revolting. You would never want somebody to know you did this, said this, or thought this. And what's shameful and embarrassing and revolting, let me just say this, God calls that sin. That sin. Take that little moment. Just take it, hold it there for a second, and now stick it on your account. It's your sin, not someone else's. And if you're like me, you probably can think of more than one of those. Could I get an amen? Amen. Stick it there. And as you traveled your way through life, you begin to have these things that you knew would rise up and point out who you were and say, he or she does not deserve to be with you forever. God. You with me? I remember as I became aware of all those things, my conscience began to condemn me. So I began to do things as a young farm boy to try to alleviate the guilt. I would help grandmas across the street. I would try not to swear when I was visiting my grandparents. You with me? But it was interesting. Though I went to church, I knew they were still there. It didn't seem to take them away. In fact, the harder I tried, I still accumulated more. Got baptized, and the guilt was still there. And then one day I heard the incredible news. Someone who had none of those on his account offered to take all of mine from my account and put them on his account and put all of his sinlessness on my account, cleanse me, and set me free. I'll never forget that moment. I stared at that for one solid month and said, that cannot be so. And then one Monday night, Bill Overway 
taught on Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, where it says, For by grace are ye saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. And at that moment, I realized there was nothing I could do to purge myself from my sin. It had already been done. All I had to do was receive and trust what Jesus did for me by faith. He would get the glory, not me. And I remember my heart jumped across and grabbed the person of Jesus Christ as my payment for sin. And the instant that happened, I knew something different had taken place. My face seemed to rest for the first time in my entire life. It just rested. It stopped roaming. It stopped trying. It rested in a mode of trusting this Jesus Christ whom I'd never met. And I didn't know it, but here's what happened. The instant I trusted him, write this down, the first thing he did with my sin is he removed those sins. He removes the sin. The psalmist tells us he removes them from us as far as the east is from the west, never to meet again. Job 14, 17 says, He sowed my sin in my iniquities in a bag. He sows them in a bag. He removes them, he puts them in a bag, and he sows it up. Number three, in Isaiah 38, he cast them. He cast them behind his back. He cannot see them anymore. Number four, in Micah, he buries them. They land behind his back, and he buries them in the depths of the sea. And then in Revelation 21, 1, he removes the sea. <laughs> if you want to bring an accusation against me that would bar me from heaven, first you've got to find the sea that God removes. And then you're going to have to plumb the depths of that to find the bag. He doesn't even know where it is. Behind his back, somehow open that thing up and then supernaturally join east to west. And while you're doing all of that, should that be your goal for time and eternity, I'll just be singing this song. You ask me why I'm happy. So I'll just tell you why. Because my sins are gone. Where are they? They're underneath the blood of the cross of Calvary. As far removed as darkness is from dawn. In that sea of God's forgetfulness. That's good enough for me. Praise God. All my filthy, dirty, rotten, wicked sins are gone. No one saves like Jesus Christ. Amen. No one cleanses like Jesus Christ. You need him. If you're not saved tonight, you need a Savior to take all those that's, to take all that shame, to take all that filth, and remove them as far as the east and from the west, and get them into the sea of God's forgiveness. He can do that. He has the power. He's the Savior. He saves completely. And if you're looking for something to do to impress God, to bribe your way into his heaven, you are 2,000 years too late. It already got done at Calvary. Look and live. Amen? Amen? We see the forgiveness of God. It's called mercy, not giving us what we do deserve here and the forgiving us of all of our sins. But second of all, we see his grace in giving us his kingdom. Write that down. Yeah, I don't know about you, but it's just good enough he forgave me. Amen? I don't have to go ahead and worry about those sins hunting me down and condemning me. I'm so glad they're gone. But, but, and that would have been enough to just miss hell in the lake of fire. But then in that cavernous hole of missing hell in the lake of fire, he fills it with his kingdom, and he gives us his, his kingdom in addition to forgiving us all our sin. Didn't he say that in Luke 12? He just jotted down Luke 12, 32. He looked at his disciples. He said, fear not, little flock, for it's your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. And what a kingdom we see. Look at it. Look at your Revelation 21. This is mind-numbing. Revelation 21, look at this kingdom. 
First of all, he said, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. He gives us a new heaven and a new earth. And then in verse 2, and I, John, saw the holy city, a third item, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. He gives us a new heaven, a new earth, and a new heavenly Jerusalem. What is this heavenly Jerusalem? The Bible is very specific in its description here. First of all, notice with me her gates in verse 21. The 12 gates are 12 pearls. This city has 12 gates, and they're 12 huge pearls. Amen? Notice her floor. It's pure gold, transparent glass. Look with me in verse number 19. The foundations are all manner of precious stones. Verse 18, the, the walls are made of pure gold. In verse number 16, it lieth four square. Here's how big it is. The length is as large as the breadth. And it's, he measured the city with a reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length, the breadth, and the height of it are equal. How big is that? You know, furlongs, that's a horse racing term. You know, the Kentucky Derby, they run so many furlongs, you know. I say furlong, I don't even know where the word came from. But how big is 12,000 furlongs? You've got to understand, here comes this heavenly Jerusalem. It's 100% gold, like transparent glass, pearls, foundations, just huge. And it's 12,000 furlongs by 12,000 furlongs by 12,000 furlongs. How big is that? 1,380 miles by 1,380 miles by 1,380 miles. You know what the footprint is? Miami... From Miami to Boston, and from the East Coast to Denver, Colorado, thunk. That's the footprint. People say, well, you know, not a lot of people, there's not a lot of room in there. Two and a half billion cubic miles of glorious golden living space. See, it still hasn't hit you. So let's do this. We're going to put a floor at every mile in the golden heavenly Jerusalem. Every mile you go up, one floor. That's pretty good. Right now most hotels are about 8 or 10 feet. So we'll go a mile, put a floor in. Go another mile, put another floor in. And we're all going to go ahead and ride the celestial elevator up that golden Jerusalem. We board that thing, and we start up that, and we decide we're just going to go halfway up. So we set it for the halfway mark, and up the elevator we go. We stop halfway up this golden cube. We step out of the elevator. We go off to the side, and there's a big, uh, a big uh, uh, what do they call that when you step out over something? What is it, what's it called? What? Help me. A, a veranda, a what? Okay. A balcony. You'll get old one day, too. Just, mm. There's this balcony. And it's a big balcony. We all step out. Halfway up the golden cube, we look out over the universe. And if the space shuttle was orbiting right then, you know where it would be? 450 miles below us. And we're only halfway up Amen. this cube. Oh, you just got it, didn't you? Yeah, wow. I mean, that almost sounds like Science fiction, you know, I mean like like Star Wars or 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 Star Trek I mean, it just it's like oh you've got to be kidding me, uh, but you know just FYI Star Trek's not real Did, did you know that? That's not no, it's not it's not I mean when they beam Scotty up or beam Spock up he doesn't get beamed up. No, 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 no. That's trick photography. They have this glass of, of sugar water that they stir, and they film that. And then they go ahead and take a picture of, of Spock, and they film him, and then they transpose the swirling sugar water over him, and then they fade Spock out, and then the sugar water fades out. Boom. That's how Spock got beamed up, beamed up by Scotty. It didn't really happen. Somebody say, well, if I knew you were going to knock Trekkies tonight, I, I wouldn't even help with a love offering. Too late. And I don't give refunds. 
Star Wars isn't real. No, 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 no. None of that stuff is real. But do you know some people will camp out two or three days before that unreal movie? And treat it like it's real. And you tell them about the heavenly Jerusalem, and you tell them about the kingdom who's coming, and you tell them about the king, and they'll fall asleep listening to that. And that is all real. This is really going to happen. This kingdom's really going to come. Jesus is really going to return. For real, as the kids would say. For real? For real. Amen? Amen? And when that moment occurs, you're either on the winning side or the losing side. I said it Sunday morning. What will you do with Jesus? Neutral you cannot be. One day your heart will be asking, what will he do with me? You know, I find it interesting in all of this that for every person, something gets forgotten forever. It's either your sin or your soul. But something about you tonight and something about me tonight will be forever forgotten for all eternity. It's either my sin, because I trust Jesus as Savior, or it will be my soul, because I rejected him from being my Savior. But for all of us, something will be forever forgotten. Oh, it is my heart's cry. It'll be your sin that's forgotten forever. Notice here as we close this out, we see there's no curse, no night, no end. Look in Revelation 22 and verse 3. There shall be no more curse. Verse 5, there shall be no night there. They have no need to, of a candle, no, neither light of the sun. For the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. No curse, no night, no end. And look at the final admonition, the last chapter of your Bible Look at what's said. First, there's a final plea. Chapter 22, verse 17. The Spirit and the bride say, Come. And let him that hear us say, Come. And let him that is a thirst come. And look at that word. And whosoever will. Let him take the water of life freely. Isn't that interesting that, that one of the, fi the final invitation, the, the final plea is that word whosoever, anyone without exception, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Wow. There's a final plea to every whosoever. Number two, there's a final promise. Look at it. It's trifold. Verse 7. Behold, I come quickly, Jesus says. Look at verse 12. Behold, I come quickly a second time. Look at what he says in verse 20. He which testify these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Oh, the final promise is he's coming soon. For those of us that are older, we can identify with this. I remember when I held my first child, little Kimberly. She was the first of six, and, and I can never forget that moment. There's just something about becoming a new parent. I remember, first of all, I thought, wow, they don't show up very pretty. <laughs> I'm being serious. But every one of my kids just, my four girls are all lookers. They're just drop dead gorgeous. Dad keeps a shotgun and ball bat and all of that good stuff. Oh yeah. All kinds of stories surrounding that. Boys are handsome boys. But I remember at the age of nine when Kimberly celebrated her ninth birthday, I did something so foolish. Later that night, lying in bed, pillow talk with my wife, I turned to her and I said this, well, hon, We've had Kimberly for half the time. We're going to have her. Guys, don't do that. Because this, this wife that was just all happy about the birthday that day suddenly turned into a blubbering mess. <gasps> Why did you say that? 
And I'm thinking, it's just a math problem. You know, 18 divided by 2 is, is 9. I don't get the big deal here. Ah! I remember that. You remember that moment? My, oh, yes, yeah, she never let me forgot. forget it. That seemed like yesterday. Our little Kimberly, mother of three now, 38. Am I right? Going to be 38. Going to be 38. And as I watch this part of the roller coaster ride, it goes so fast. I, I want to say this. You will get old way sooner than you ever thought you would. Time is going to end for you way quicker than you ever dreamed it would. Am I right, brother? Well, I'm telling you. I'm reminded of that song, and it's one of our favorites. We always love the, the, the musical, Fiedle on the Roof. You know. I'd always look at my daughters and say, you know, uh, you know if I, I'd sing, if I was a rich man. You know? And then I'd say, but my daughters, they make me poor. They quit it, Dad. But there's one song in there, boy, it captures it. Sunrise, sunset, sunrise, sunset. Swiftly fly those years. Oh, how fast time goes. Your life will end sooner than you ever thought it would. Before you know it, you'll be standing in front of God. Just like that. Behold, I come quickly. It's a final promise. But then there's a final reply, and it's the only one that ought to be there. In verse 20, he which testified these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Look at the response. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Can you murmur in reply when you hear the cry, Here he comes. Here he comes. He is coming. He is coming. He is coming. He is coming. Amen. So be it. Even so come, Lord Jesus. Jesus Christ said in Luke 21, He said, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. I close with this. I grew up on a farm in Minnesota, the oldest of four. A German father who felt hard work was the answer to any problem you had. As the firstborn and the oldest, the expectation levels in that German home were screaming high, especially on all of us, but especially upon me. People ask me, how did you do so well in the Marine Corps? I just simply said, my father prepared me for it. It was just a step across when I joined the Marines. I was already there, raised in a home that ran just like the Corps. I remember we never bought a stick of lumber. We tore barns down in the summer and pounded nails out in the winter and reused all that lumber to build the entire farm while we did all the other stuff that a beef operation required. But I remember once in a while, Dad would go into town, had to pick up some parts, get some seed corn, do something. He'd be gone for an hour or two. And before Dad would go, he would give us a list David, Doug, Kathy, Ronnie, and he'd say, here's what I want you to do while I'm gone. As we watched that blue Chevy pickup go down the half-mile gravel driveway, disappear, do you think we went immediately to go do Dad's jobs? Oh, no. He's gone. We can't see him. He can't see us. And immediately we went to do our will, not his. It's the nature of the beast. Don't look at me weird. Your kids are doing it to you right now. You don't even know it. Once they get you one kid, one grandkid shows up, they'll confess everything because they know you can't kill them because then you've got to raise the kid. It's in chess we call it a pin move. My kids did this to me. I said, you did what? When we were, are you kidding me? <laughs> and so off we go. We're doing our own thing. Building our forts. Go ahead and plinking rabbits, just having a ball. And you know, when you get absorbed with yourself, you kind of lose track of time. And all of a sudden, you see, those gravel roads had washboard. 
as people would accelerate and slow down, there were washboard, and that end of the half-mile driveway, you couldn't see it. There was a little hill. But every vehicle that passed across the nose of that, that driveway would hit that washboard, and every vehicle had its own sound. And Dad's blue Chevy pickup, we knew the sound. And we'd be merrily doing our own thing, and all of a sudden we'd, we'd hear that vehicle hit the washboard road, and we'd be, oh! and here's what we would do. Dad's coming! Just like that. And it wasn't this attitude, oh, Dad's coming. No, Dad's coming! And we begin to look like the Keystone Cops. I mean, running everywhere, trying to patch up something, going and make it look like we tried to do something. What are we going to say? All right, let's get our story together. What happened? What happened? You know, get the lie all cemented, you know. Oh. I remember those moments when someone said, Here comes Dad. And your stomach would just lurch because you hadn't been doing his will, you were doing yours. But once in a while, we got it right. We got everything done, and with a little extra time, we then maybe did what we wanted to do. And when we heard the truck and somebody said, here comes Dad, we were standing there looking forward to his return. You say, why? Because we did his will, not ours. And I'm going to tell you something. There was something sweet about Dad as he would go and look at, Dad, Dad very rarely gave a compliment. If he gave you a compliment, you earned it. He always said, don't compliment too much. You just make them too cheap. That's what Dad would say. And he'd look at our work, and we'd follow him along, little kids, and then he'd turn and he'd say, good job. Proud of you. That was worth a million bucks to hear my dad Good job, son. Proud of you. What you living for now? Your will? Or those words, well done, thou good and faithful servant? Amen. When you hear the words, ready or not, here he comes, what your heart say? Can you say, amen, even so come? Lord Jesus. Let's bow our hearts before the Lord. Heads are bowed, eyes are closed for just a moment. I have one question for you. Here's my question. No one's looking around. I'm just, I'm the only one looking around. If you're at home, you can even, uh, you can even answer this honestly right where you are. But when you hear the statement, ready or not, here he comes. I want to ask you this. Are you ready for the return of Jesus Christ. You would say, you know what, preacher? I'm ready for Jesus Christ to come back right now, just how I'm believing and just how I'm living. Right now, I'm ready for his return, just the way I'm believing and just the way I'm living. Slip your hand up as a testimony and put it back down. I'm ready for him to come back right now. Slip your hand up, put it right back down. If, say, I'm ready. I'm ready for his return right now, just the way I'm living and just how I'm believing. Amen. Many of you could put your hands up. Many of you actually could not. Let me tell you, there's only two reasons you can't raise your hand to that question. Number one, you're not redeemed. You're not on the winning side. You're not on the winning side. You're in the court of the condemned. If you couldn't raise your hand because you're not sure you're saved, I just would beg you, would you get this settled? The consequences are too great to miss heaven because there's no halfway point. If you miss heaven, you go to hell and then to the lake of fire. There's no in-between. I don't care what some religions teach. There's no in-between. It's one or the other. You're either going to heaven or you're not. So you say, well, I'm not sure I'm redeemed. I'd come get some help. I'd come get some help. But listen, the other reason you couldn't, you say, I know I'm redeemed. But I'm not right. I'm not right. There's something not right. And I'm not ready for his return. There's going to be shame. Yeah, he's my father. Yep, Jesus is my savior. But I'm not ready for the rattle of the return 
of my Heavenly Father and, and my Savior because I I've been doing my will I've not been doing his why not you couldn't raise your hand for that reason man I'd come get some help I just crumble and ask God to help listen let's be very frank in your strength you can't do his will that's what grace is all about why don't you come ask him for the power the desire and the ability to do his will just say God I can't do it I just can't could you do it through me that, that's what grace is you can't do this you couldn't save yourself that's why you needed a savior and you can't live for this savior that's why you need the savior that's all grace is it's the desire power and ability to do God's will not yours and you ought to come and ask God for that you ought to ask God for help you ought to just ask him for his power to do his will because Jesus is coming again soon he's coming Heads about eyes are closed. Father, I pray that you would work in the heart of every individual here. They couldn't raise their hand. They said they're ready for your son's return. Maybe they misunderstood the question, but Father, if they understood it, Lord, would you just tap their heart and show them what would need to take place for them to be ready. Maybe they need saved. Pray they'd step out and get some help. But Lord, if they're saved, they're doing their will, not yours. Lord, just get them to the point where they crumble and just ask you for help and strength and grace to do what they can't even do. That is to do your will. Lord, would they ask you, just ask you for help and grace to do your will. Thank you for your son. Thank you for our salvation. Thank you for your power. How you give grace. You give it abundantly. Help every one of us by the time this service is over to be able to say amen. Even so come Lord Jesus. I pray in Jesus name. Amen. Let's stand. Listen to the song as it's being sung. Heads are bowed. Eyes are closed. Just give you an opportunity. You want to slip out and come. Go ahead, brother, sing that. There's coming a day. There is coming a day when no heartache shall come. No more clouds. If you need to pray, come on. just playing softly we're going to sing that last verse in just a moment you ready you ready for his return just give you an opportunity one more shot say i need to get something right just for you that's all this is just for you need to get something right need to get something right king is coming need to get something right some are coming you just come and get something right. Ready or not, here he comes. All the events have been rattling the herald of his soon return. Everything's in place. Israel's back in her land, gathered as one nation in unbelief. The global cash of society is on the verge of happening. Never had that before. 21 signs and sins in 2 Timothy 3, they're all in place now. 
And this global government response, this hasn't happened since the Tower of Babel. These days are different. The king is coming. And there's no reason you can't be ready for his return. Absolutely not. Get saved. Get right. Just a moment more, and then we'll sing that last verse. King is coming. King is coming. Page 627. 627. Let's sing that last verse together. I'll certainly be available to talk to you afterwards, my wife. I know your pastor as well. 627, 627 on the second verse. entered into the heart of man the things which God hath prepared for them that love him. Uh, Spurgeon used to say that um, he felt inadequate on two subjects, one more than the other, preaching on hell. How can you really describe the horrors of it, the reality of it, and do it any justice? I guess you just got to go with scripture. But heaven, even more so. You know, with hell, we have a lot of analogies on earth. We can compare it to a lot of things. But uh, according to Paul, there isn't a whole lot we can compare it to. And, uh, but it's going to be beyond anything we ever imagined. And you got describing that new Jerusalem. How incredible is that? And just think of your thought life. Imagine your thought life always being what it should be. All the bad memories gone. No, no temptation, no temptation around us, no ability to even respond to temptation. You're just, you're just praising God without any, any hindrances whatsoever. New bodies will be with him, and we'll all get along just fine. <laughs> See, God will fix everybody else finally. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Dr. Gipp, would you lead us in a word of prayer? All right. Thank you, Brother Summerdor, for being with us this week. Be sure to let them know that you'll be praying for them as they move on from here. Amen. Brother. Father, it is good to be saved. And God, if life saved is a cake, you coming back is the icing. And we look forward to that day, God. We look forward to the day that all the things down here that uh, slow us down, burden us, um, break our hearts, uh, dispirit us, God, all those things are going to be behind us. It'll be heaven. And you did this. This was your idea. So we thank you, God. We thank you for making heaven so easy to attain, just trusting. Easy for us, just trusting what Jesus Christ did for us. It wasn't easy for him. So, God, thank you so much for heaven. Thank you, God, for while we wait for you to come back, that you give us a chance to do something for you. What an honor, God. What a good thing. And I ask you to bless every one of us now, Father, that we'd leave here edified. Had they been edified, we would live to your glory. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.